Hi everybody, my name is Kyle Fogarty. I'm part of the Agri Forward CDT. And today I'm going to be talking about uncertainty quantification and in particular the random walk the trough is Hastings algorithm. So in this uh, short session today, what we're going to cover is a bit of an introduction to the concept of inverse UQ and Bayes theorem. We'll then move on to introduce the idea of random walk metropolis Hastings. And we'll finish with a example of random walk metropolis Hastings and how we can implement that quite simply in Python. Okay, so let's start with a bit of an introduction to Bayesian inference. So what is an inverse problem is perhaps the, a good place to start. So if we can define it quite loosely, we could say that it's given a set of observations, we wish to infer the sort of causal factors that produce them. Perhaps a little more concretely in what we're going to be looking at, if we consider the inverse problem where we have observations of a system, perhaps with some noise, and we have a form of parametric model, so this could be a differential equation or an integral equation or some, some form of um, model of our system, then what we aim to do is be able to infer the parameters of the system given the observations. Now, there's many ways of tackling this sort of problem, but we'll introduce a Bayesian framework that will allow us to fuse the uncertainty that we have on our observations and um, make predictions about the parameters of the system via inference. So you may recall from last uh, seminar, we introduced the idea of a conditional probability, where we said that the probability of, and this is um, red, the probability of A given B is equal to the probability of the intersection of A and B divided by the total probability of B. Well, given this definition, there's nothing stopping us from actually um, changing the order of A and B. So we could also quite simply pose the probability of B given A. And that too is equal to the intersection of B and A divided by the total probability of A. And the next thing to note is that, well, the probability of B intersection A is exactly equal to the probability of A intersection B. They commute, so them two operations commute, which means that we have the probability of B given A times by the probability of A is equal to the probability of A given B times by the probability of B. So if we do a little bit of rearranging, it's not too much, just divide by the probability of B and then bring the uh, switch the order around, we end up with the usual sort of notation of how Bayes' theorem is laid out. So that's the probability of A given B is equal to the probability of B given A times by the probability of A divided by the probability of B. So that's Bayes' theorem there. And as you, as you, as you can see, it's sort of just a simple consequence of the definition of conditional probability. So once we have Bayes' theorem, we can start to think about how we can use that to infer our parameters. Now what we'll look to do is extend Bayes' theorem to talk about probability densities, but first we should introduce our idea of a model. So we'll keep it quite abstract at this stage. So let m, where x is some variable, and theta here is the parameters of the model. Define a model and we also have observations of that model. So we'll call these y and they're a function of x of the system. Now our aim will be to obtain what we call the posterior distribution and that is the probability distribution of theta, so the parameters of this model, given the observations y. Now what we can do to obtain that posterior distribution is we can actually use Bayes' theorem. So we can extend Bayes' theorem to deal with probability densities and so what we have is we have the, the posterior is equal to all this on the right hand side and all these things have names in the Bayesian framework. So we call the probability density of the observation given the parameter the likelihood. And this is a choice in our model that models the probability of the observation given the parameter theta. 
Next, we have the probability distribution over theta itself, which we call the prior. And this allows us to model the prior beliefs over the parameters theta. And finally, we have the probability density over the observations, which we call the evidence. Now, typically, the evidence is far too complex to compute analytically, because really it requires us to do an integral over the likelihood, which we just introduced, where we integrate out all of the parameters of the likelihood, so in this case, theta. And so instead, what we typically do is we write that the posterior distribution is just proportional to the likelihood and uh, multiplied by the prior. So the question now becomes, how do we get from our prior belief to the posterior distribution? And the answer to the question is with Markov chain uh, Monte Carlo techniques. And in particular, we're going to look at the random warp metropolis Hastings algorithm. So the idea behind random warp metropolis Hastings is that we are going to draw samples from the posterior distribution. But we'll draw the samples in such a clever way that we are able to work with this idea of proportionality rather than equality, which is what eliminating using the evidence um, really allows us to do. Now, in this presentation, we're going to neglect the technical details of how random warp metropolis Hastings works in terms of Markov, constructing Markov chains and um, the sort of technical details around that. But we will instead sort of focus on more of an intuitive idea of what's going on with the acceptance probability of random warp metropolis Hastings. So recall that the posterior is proportional in the sense to the likelihood and the prior. So there's some constant, in this case c, that is multiplied by the likelihood and the prior which will produce our posterior distribution. We just don't know what c is. The key to random walk metropolis Hastings is to consider the ratio of different um, probability distributions. So instead of looking at distributions, let's look at absolute values of probabilities. And suppose that we have, in this case, we have the a parameter of a model sigma uh, theta i, and we have theta i minus 1. So these are just two different values of a parameter. Then if we actually plug in the likelihood and the prior, and also this proportionality constant, c, we find that when we look at the ratio of two of these, c will cancel out. Okay, so that's the first stage is to see, notice that when we look at the ratio, the proportionality sort of cancels itself out. And so we have an equality now. So when, we, when we're thinking about this ratio, let's sort of visualize what's going on. So let's say we start at uh, theta naught. So this is going to be our initial sort of... Um, parameter that we choose in terms of sampling. And then we propose theta 1. And what we say is, well, what's the probability of theta 1 divided by the probability of theta 0? Well, in this case, we have theta 0 is quite a big value, and theta 1 is quite a small value. And so when we do something that's quite small divided by something that's quite big, we end up with something that's again, quite small. And so if we notice here that we're going from a region of high density to a region of low density, then we start to get this idea that the ratio, and it, the ratio being low, sort of encodes this idea that the probability density in that region is low. Okay, so what about if we choose another parameter now, let's say theta 2. So in this case, theta 2 is larger. So if we now look at the ratio of theta 2 to theta 1, we have something that's larger divided by something that's smaller. And so this value is something that's in general larger than before. And so what we have is we're starting to get this idea that when this ratio is larger, we're moving towards something of higher probability density 
So moving towards this region here where it's higher probability density. Okay, so now we've introduced a little bit of the intuition behind what's going on. Let's have a look at some pseudocode for the algorithm. So the input for the algorithm is the target PDF, so probability density function. And in that case, we're, we're looking at the proportionality. So it's going to be the product of the likelihood and the prior that we introduced previously. Now we have a scaling parameter beta, which will explain a little bit what that means um, shortly. And we also have an initial point x naught. So this is going to be the first parameter that we choose. And we have to have the requirement that um, this parameter, the, the probability of the posterior of this parameter must be greater than zero. Okay, and the output from this algorithm is a sequence of samples from the probability distribution uh, pi of y of theta. So this is the probability of theta given the observations y. And the algorithm itself, well, it's here. And it's written in how many lines? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it's a very simple algorithm to implement. It's only seven lines long. And all we do is we iterate for a set number um, of iterations. We begin by generating a proposal for the um, parameter of the model. And this proposal is chosen from a Gaussian, where the mean of that Gaussian is the previous parameter. And the variance is defined by this scaling parameter beta, so beta squared being the variance. And secondly, we generate a number from the uniform distribution, zero to one. And then what we do is we check whether this value that we just generated is less than or equal to the minimum of one or, and this is where we get to the idea of the ratio of distributions. So xi is the new parameter that we've just uh, proposed and theta i minus 1 is the parameter that we saved previously. Okay, so what this is saying is if this ratio is quite small, i.e. we're heading towards a region of low probability density, then we have less probability of actually accepting it. Whereas if this is quite high, with the maximum being one, because we must take the minimum of one and this ratio, then when it's quite high, let's say it's approaching one, then we're very likely to accept this parameter. And so we update theta i, so that's the current um, sample from this uh, posterior distribution, to either xi, if we um, accept it according to the acceptance probability, or we just copy the previous value into theta i, if not. Okay. So that's sort of some pseudocode for the random walk metropolis Hastings. We'll see how to implement it in Python in a few minutes time. But before we look at Python, it's perhaps good to introduce a bit of a test problem that we can program up in Python to do some random walk metropolis Hastings on. So in this test problem, what we're going to do is consider radioactive decay. So we're going to consider the radioactive decay of a single isotope. And we'll assume this sort of uh, first order differential equation governs the um, underlying radioactive decay. So what we're going to do is assume that we want to infer the initial condition n naught of the system. And also we're going to, in the Python implementation, also infer the decay constant lambda. And what we'll do is we'll assume that our measurements are corrupted by some Gaussian additive noise, such that our measurements y are equal to the model of the system n plus some Gaussian um, random noise that has mean zero and variance of sigma squared. Okay, so the next step is to produce our solution map. Now, in the case of a first order differential equation, this just requires that we solve that. So we can use the integrating factor method to um, find a solution to n of t 
And once we apply boundary conditions, such that at time t equals zero, the initial amount n is equal to n naught, then we yield our solution map. Okay, so now we have, this is our model of our system at each time step t. Now let's suppose that we make 10 observations of our system through evenly spaced time intervals. So y1, y2, y all the way up to y10. Now using equation eight that we introduced earlier, we can find the likelihood. Now let's go back to equation eight, have a quick look at that. So equation eight, we said that we had Gaussian additive noise. Now, importantly, this means that if we have rearranged this equation, so we say y minus our model of the system is equal to a Gaussian random variable, it means that that's exactly what we have here. So we have the, the likelihood of our um, system is given by a mean zero random variable, a mean zero Gaussian random variable with variance given by sigma squared. So in this case, it's just the difference between our model and the observation. So the final thing that we need is we need a choice of prior. Now the choice of prior really allows us to regularize the system. So for example, if our model parameters physically can't take negative values, which is the case with n naught and lambda, so the initial amount can't be negative and the decay constant also can't be negative, then we can enforce that with the prior. So in this simple example, what we're gonna do is to choose the uniform distribution and for n naught, we'll choose that to be naught 30 and for lambda, we'll choose it to be naught two. So these are choices that you can make when you're solving your Bayesian inverse problems. Okay, so now we're gonna have a quick look at how we can implement this in Python. So uh, here we're looking at a notebook that I prepared earlier, um, and you will be able to find this notebook linked underneath the video where you can open it up in Google Colab. So as usual, we'll begin by importing useful tools. So we'll use NumPy for number generation and matplotlib for plotting. And then we also have this Seaborn package, which allows us to do some nice um, overlays in terms of statistical um, plotting. The first thing that we're going to do is just to find some functions that will simulate our radioactive decay process. Um, we don't need to worry about this too much. We'll pretend this is a bit of a sort of black box that we can't see inside. Um, and really what we do is we uh, observe the experiment and this is the data that we generate. So every time we call this function, we'll generate new data. And so what we have here is we have our decay events and we have the equally spaced uh, intervals that we measure at. This process definitely looks like it could be modeled by exponential decay, but there's also clearly some noise within our measurements. Okay, so we have our um, data. Next, we implement random walk metropolis hastings. So as we've seen earlier, this is quite a simple algorithm to implement. The things that we pass into this uh, function are the initial um, sample of n naught and decay. We also pass in this beta term, which is the uh, thing that controls how wide the Gaussian distribution is in, our, in terms of our random walk. We define the number of iterations, defines how many samples we're going to return back. And then just for, in this case, I've included um, this plot um, term, which allows us to turn on or off plotting, which we'll have a look at in a minute. Um, and that should allow us to see roughly what's going on in terms of how the random walk metropolis tasting algorithm works. So we'll run that. And here we just define the acceptance probability, which is, of course, as we discussed, the likelihood in the priors. So in this case, we just have a uniform distribution on n naught uh, between 0 and 30 and 0 and 2 on the decay. And the likelihood is just defined by this um, equation that we presented in the slides. So this will change for the problem that you define. So this is the sort of thing that you will, you'll have to define for your specific problem when you're looking at Bayesian inference. Um, 
but it's, it comes down to choices of the, the prior distribution and the likelihood function that you want to model your process as. So we can have a look at what the, uh, the prior distributions look like. So on N0, as we expect, it is a uniform distribution in the region 0 to 30, and a uniform distribution on 0 to 2 for the decay constant. Now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to turn this uh, auxiliary function at the end. We have generate plot, so this is so we can see what's happening with the random warm metropolis Hastings output. And what we'll do is we'll run, so we call the function here with random walk uh, mh. We're going to pass in, so this is our initial sort of um, sample from n0 of 25 and lambda 0.2. And then we define the size of the Gaussian um, random walk variance. So that's 0.4 and 0.2 in this case. You can play with these numbers in the uh, notebook and we'll also turn plotting on so you can see what's happening so let's run that for 100 iterations which really isn't many samples from the posterior distribution but hopefully it'll give us an idea of what is happening in terms of the algorithm so if we run that here we see uh, so the algorithm is now generating samples so in the top we have the n naught and the sort of histogram of the samples that are coming from that. And in the bottom, we have the decay constant and the histogram of samples that are coming from that. So as we see, this is where we get the phrase random walk from. So it's walking through parameter space in both the n naught and in the lambda decay constant. And it's picking the next value depending upon how that acceptance ratio um, is calculated. So hopefully that gives you somewhat of an idea of what's going on with random warp metropolis hastings. At every time step of the algorithm, we uh, propose some new um, parameters and we um, sort of calculate their acceptance probability and then we only accept them if uh, the uniform variable here u that we pick is uh, less than or equal to that acceptance ratio okay so we've seen it with plotting but of course we could we couldn't get many samples that way so if we turn plotting off and let's say we want to generate 1 million samples um, and we run it this time as plotting is turned off it should run a little quicker of course, this is still a sampling method, so it's, it does take time to be able to generate samples from our posterior distribution. So we'll wait for that to calculate. Okay, so that's finished. And now what we can do is we can look at the results. So this first plot is gonna be the number of samples, uh, sorry, this first plot will be the samples generated of the n naught posterior. So let's have a look at what that looks like. Okay, so as we saw previously when we had 100 samples, when we start to get more and more, so in this case we have a million samples, um, we see that these plots are, tend to have this sort of uh, shape, and this is typical of what we see in random walk. And as we draw more and more samples, we actually converge closer and closer to the true underlying um, posterior distribution for this uh, variable n naught. And similarly, we can do the same for the decay constant. And again, we have the samples here and the converting the samples into a histogram on this side, we see the shape of the distribution is quite heavy tailed. So here we've introduced the random walk metropolis Hastings algorithm and we've shown how we can use it in just quite a simple example. Uh, what I recommend doing is having a look through this notebook and maybe play with some of the parameters yourself and start to get a feel for how it works. Random walk metropolis Hastings and other Markov chain Monte Carlo techniques, they're a really powerful tool. And below this video, I've also linked some further uh, materials for you to have a look at some
other methods, for example, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, which is an extension of this idea that allows you to generate these samples much quicker. Uh, so yeah, I hope you've enjoyed this and that's the end of the talk. Thank you.